Marie Brown is Director of the Child Wellbeing Unit in the New Zealand Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. And um, for those of you who were at um, Child Aware 2019, you probably recall Marie um, presented at that conference uh, on New Zealand's approach to child safety and wellbeing. And as you can tell, she is joining us by Skype. Um, and so would you please welcome Marie. I want to first acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and pay respects to their culture and to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also want to acknowledge the Associate Minister, the National Children's Minister, Paris and the other wonderful young people we've just heard from, Richard Weston, and all the other participants at today's event. I'm really sorry I can't be there to talk to you in person, but I'm very grateful to Brian and Stella for the invitation and to the IT teams who made my virtual attendance possible. As the coronavirus has shown, in many ways we are all more connected than ever in these extraordinary times. I think um, we might just go to video, uh, to audio, because I think um, there'll be some delay in my presentation otherwise, Stella. So just bear with me. We'll just you have to listen to me from here on in. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me still? Yeah. Great. So I've been asked today to talk about our engagement with children and young people um, as part of the development of New Zealand's uh, first child and youth wellbeing strategy, and how their views influence the overall direction and focus areas for the strategy. I'll also talk a little bit about what went well and what didn't, and what we're doing next. But first, to give you a bit more context, I'll start with a really brief background to the New Zealand strategy, and in particular, the legislation that guides it. Back in late 2017, when the new Labour New Zealand First Coalition Government came into power, one of the first things that our Prime Minister, right on that Honourable Jacinda Ardern, did was to make herself Minister for Child Poverty Reduction and to introduce the Child Poverty Reduction Bill into the House. That bill would not only require all successive governments to set and report on child poverty reduction targets, it would also require them to develop a strategy to improve child wellbeing more generally. That bill was passed into law uh, a year later with near unanimous parliamentary support. I just want to, um, to flag some of the most important provisions of the new law. The law states that the wellbeing strategy must set out the outcomes the government is intending to achieve and the policies it intends to implement to address the wellbeing of all children, but with a focus on three specific groups. Those with greater needs, those experiencing child poverty and socioeconomic disadvantage, and those on the cusp of statutory care or the youth justice system, those who are actually in care or those transitioning out of the care system. The legislation also requires that children and young people, Māori and the Children's Commissioner, must be consulted on the development of the strategy. And there's a requirement for the Minister to report annually to Parliament on progress and how the strategy is going, what outcomes have been achieved. And that includes specific reporting on outcomes for Māori children. Importantly, the strategy is also an enduring legal requirement and it needs to be reviewed or refreshed at least every three years. It can't be a one-off thing. So as I mentioned, the legislation requires that the strategy be developed after consultation with children and young people. And we decided really early on we didn't want to take a minimum compliance approach to that legislation. We wanted to hear from children and young people what they felt was important for a good life. We wanted their ideas and insights on the outcomes that we should be aiming for. We asked the same question of parents, families and experts in different fields. We also wanted to test our early ideas on the focus for the first strategy. Essentially, we were aiming to crowdsource the strategy, if you like. We also wanted to involve as many New Zealanders as we could to help build public ownership in the strategy and to stimulate ongoing public interest and focus on child and youth wellbeing issues. So here's how we went about it. 
Our study equivalents the huge body of existing engagement findings and research and data on how New Zealand children and families were faring. It was also already a child wellbeing model that had been developed in our care and protection system. And there were multiple indigenous frameworks for Māori and Pacific wellbeing. It was a living standards uh, model that the Treasury was developing based on the OECD's work. So from all of that, we developed a simple framework uh, on an A3. It had proposed outcomes, principles, and focus areas as the basis for discussion. We established a reference group of community experts, and we used officials groups as sounding boards. I wanted just to call out here to um, Arasi's excellent work in this area as well, and the NEST's key result areas for all young Australians. We didn't come across this until much later on the process, but it's conceptually really similar to what we came up with. And it's a great foundation for the work that's being done across Australia on child wealth, uh, youth wellbeing, as far as I can see. So importantly, we did some initial pre-testing of our A3 with children and young people. The Children's Commissioner's Office did this for us, in fact. They tested the draft content and the language with around 250 children and young people. And they helped us refine it based on the feedback we got. So once we had our refined A3 and we got cabinet sign-off, in September 2018, we started a major public engagement process around the central question, what would make New Zealand the best place in the world for children and young people? Hopefully you can see on the slide some of the ways that children and young people have their say. One group even sent the Prime Minister a t-shirt with their messages. So we, we engaged in different ways. The Prime Minister held a children's picnic in her official residence to begin the engagement process. Mainstream media covered that picnic, and she also did video messages on social media, encouraging people to have their say. We also had face-to-face -face meetings, workshops, and focus groups with different audiences. We ran two online surveys, one tailored to younger people and one to adults. We invited public submissions so that people could give more detailed feedback. And we encouraged children and young people to share their thoughts via way means of postcard. Um, the Prime Minister committed to reading every single one of these postcards sent to her, and she got literally hundreds of them. And here are some examples of the postcards she received from children as young as five and six. So with the support of partner agencies, we received feedback from around 10,000 New Zealanders, including 6,000 children and young people. So that means about three-fifths of the total number of people we heard from were children and young people, which is just what we wanted. The Children's Commission's Office and Uraka Tamariki led our face-to-face -face engagement with children and young people on our behalf. And they work with local schools and partners who have the trusted relationships with different groups of young people. Yeah. We had a series of regional meetings, or hui, to engage with Māori uh, families and whānau organisations. We had um, meetings with health se uh, sector people, around 700 participants of those. We met with Pacific and other ethnic groups, uh, and with community groups generally. We made a real effort to hear from um, people whose voices are a lot less often heard, such as children with disabilities or with parents with disabilities, the rainbow community, refugee and migrant communities, and young people with youth justice facilities. So the Children's Commissioner's Office in Oranga Tamariki produced a report called What Makes a Good Life? And that summarised what we heard from children and young people. Their findings were also then incorporated into our wider engagement summary report called Have Your Say. And for anyone interested, uh, those reports are both available on our website. I'll give you the address for that at the end of this presentation. But what did they say? The engagement uh, with children and young people included those who are more likely to be experiencing challenges in their lives. And this slide captures key insights from those groups. Overwhelmingly, they told us that they want to be accepted for who they are, they want to be valued and supported, not judged. Many children and young people said they face significant challenges such as racism, bullying, discrimination, violence, and a feeling of continually being let down. Many were concerned about the well-being of their family or their whanau, their wider family, or their friends. Some talked about hiding their own needs as they didn't want to create more stress for their parents. They saw their own well-being as intrinsically linked to that of their support group. Many children and young people talked about the importance of the basics, but they also felt that their good life was a bit more than that. Their strong message was that young people needed to have a say, 
not just in what support is, is provided to them, but also in how it is delivered. So these insights, together with the feedback we receive from other um, wide public engagement, help shape the direction and the content of our strategy. We re reworked the outcomes, um, the areas and the principles. For example, we split one of the proposed outcomes areas, which had been belong, contribute and valued, into two separate outcomes to better reflect the two important but quite distinct concepts that young people talked about. We, one, we renamed one accepted, respected and connected. So this is about the ability to be themselves, to have a sense of belonging, to live free from discrimination and to be connected to their culture and their community. The other outcome area we renamed involved and empowered, which captures more the idea of agency and voice and being supported to make positive choices and exercise growing autonomy. So I clocked off the final framework for the strategy. I don't expect you to be able to read the image, but essentially it sets out a shared understanding of what's important for child and youth wellbeing, what the government is doing and how, and also how we will measure progress. And on the other side of this A3 is a summary of the initial program of action that the government committed to. So 75 actions led by more than 20 government agencies. The strategy itself was launched by the Prime Minister with around 400 children at an intermediate school in August last year. She also made a launch video, which I'd like to show you now. Have you ever heard the saying that New Zealand is the best place in the world to bring up children? What if we flipped that on its head? What if we asked what we need to do to make New Zealand the best place in the world to be a child? And that's essentially the vision that we have for our child and youth wellbeing strategy. Many of you will know that some time ago, we produced a law that holds the government to account on reducing child poverty in New Zealand. Well, when we passed that law, we said that we knew that we needed to do more than just lift the incomes of family and whanau to improve wellbeing for children. We needed to think about their lives as a whole. That's why we said we'd produce a child and youth wellbeing strategy. And that's exactly what we've done. Now, to start with building this work, we decided to ask New Zealanders, including children, what they thought we needed. We got feedback from over 10,000 people, including 6,000 children. Now, I read every postcard that those children produced for that strategy, and I can tell you a couple of things that really stood out for me. The number of children that said that they experienced racism or discrimination or felt like they couldn't always be who they were is something that I didn't expect. And that's why it's front and centre in our strategy. Every child deserves to be able to live with a feeling of excess, acceptance and belonging and to be valued for who they are. And we know that's going to take work across all our government. Children raised the importance of education and accessing education, but they also said that it mattered to them that their whānau and their family were well supported, that they had all they, they needed to thrive. And that's why lifting family incomes continues to be a big focus in the strategy as well. Overall, we have 75 different actions in our plan. Uh, in the 2019 budget, we've put $3.5 billion into supporting the work that we know we need to do to lift the well-being of children and young people in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But we can't do it alone. These are big, complex issues that we're trying to tackle, and it will take an approach of all of government, but actually iwi, community, local government as well. We need to work in partnership. So I really encourage you, take a look at this strategy. Tell us whether or not there are things that you think you can do in your local community to try and lift the well-being of children and young people. How can we work together? Ultimately, though, I absolutely believe New Zealand can be the best place in the world to be a child as long as we all work together. So as highlighted in the Prime Minister's message, there were a number of specific policy areas raised by children and young people that really stood out for us. The next few slides focus on those areas, what we heard and then what's been done about it. In many areas, the course for change came from other quarters as well, and in some areas work was already underway. However, the voices of children and young people certainly added weight and a sense of urgency to those calls. Many children and young people talked about wanting to be able to spend more time with their parents and their extended family and how this helped make them feel loved and secure and confident in who they were. Parents also echoed this theme, particularly those working long days or shift work. Many young people talked about the tough times their parents had experienced, 
often poverty or violence related, and how earlier and better parenting support and practical support would have reduced stress on the whole family. And many young people at statutory care talked about just wanting to, their home situation to be better so that they could safely return home to their birth family. So here's some of the actions in response to all of that. To support that vital early attachment and bonding between parents and their babies, paid parental leave has recently been extended in New Zealand from 18 to 22 weeks, with a further increase to 26 weeks from July this year. And there are also major reviews underway to improve the quality and the take-up of our universal antenatal and early child health services for all our parents with young children. As part of that, the government is trialling a nursery and family partnership model, which will offer enhanced support for those with mental health or addiction issues. It's also working with Māori and other community providers to develop new models of earlier and more intensive support to families when there are initial safety concerns for their children, with the aim of preventing them being uplifted and taken into state care. And the government's recently also boosted funding for the Final Order Programme. Developed by Māori leaders, Whana Ora takes a holistic, strengths-based approach. It works with families in need and supports them to make their own plan to stabilise their situation and build their resilience. There's also a national strategy and action plan to eliminate family violence and sexual violence, including child abuse and online exploitation in development. And last year's budget provided significant new investment in this area. The second major issue we heard about was child poverty. Children and young people told us they worry about the stress their parents are under. They talked about their families not having enough money for healthy food or to pay bills, transport, petrol, health care, and about living in damp or overcrowded housing. Many children and adults talked about children going to school hungry. Some young people told us about being homeless or about not having enough money how not having enough money can lead them to commit crime. They talked about having enough for the basics, wanting enough for the basics, but also a little more, so that they wouldn't miss out on the life opportunities that others had. Depending on which child poverty measures used, it's estimated that between 16 and 23% of all New Zealand children currently live in poverty. So addressing the structural causes of poverty is a, really a key focus for this strategy. That means looking at a whole range of issues, from wage settings to income support and in-kind assistance like food into the housing market. Some of the recent initiatives uh, introduced include the implementation of the Families Package, which will increase incomes of all low and middle income families with children by around $75 a week on average. That package includes a best start payment of $60 a week for all parents of new babies in the first year of life with additional payments to up, up to three years for low-income families. And that's all part of a longer-term overhaul of the whole welfare system, which has a focus on child well-being. Another key change is the indexing of main benefits to wages for the first time, as well as making progressive increases to the minimum wage in New Zealand. There are a whole range of actions underway to ease housing pressures and to support people into stable, affordable, warm, dry housing. Free doctor's visits have been extended to up to age 14 now, and schools are now being funded so that they do not have to ask parents for school donations and cause stress on, on low-income families. The government's also trialling a new healthy free lunches program in primary and intermediate schools to address food insecurity and support young children's health and learning. These images are from the launch of the free lunches in schools pilot program on the first day of term this year. Starting off with 7,000 students in, in 31 schools, um, it's expected to quadruple by the end of this year, giving around 21,000 students access to a free lunch each day. Good health, including mental health, featured strongly in responses from children and young people about what having a good life means. Young people were particularly concerned about anxiety and depression, about the impact of cyberbullying, and about our appalling rates of youth suicide in New Zealand. They talked about better and more accessible mental health promotion 
and services tailored to their needs, their culture and their gender. Very similar to what I heard from the young people speaking before. Last year's budget had a very strong focus on mental health. It provided funding to progressively extend free school-based health services to all low and mid decile secondary schools. These services provide free primary health, including mental health care. There's also significant new investment in expanding access and choices of mental health and addiction support, including where those services are offered. And they've been co-designed with a range of different groups, including young people. For the first time, specialist forensic mental health services are now funded in all youth justice facilities to meet the needs of those young people. A pilot program has been introduced providing free counselling and age-appropriate mental health support for all young people aged 18 to 25 with moderate or mild to moderate mental health conditions. And in September last year, the government also launched a national suicide prevention strategy uh, which includes a focus on children and young people and a commitment to engaging with them on what specific actions they would like to see. So all these health initiatives will take time to scale up, but it's a start in this area. Wellbeing at school was another really strong theme. We heard that first and foremost, school should be a place where young people feel safe and feel they belong. They also want to learn in a way that suits them and to feel that they are learning things that will give them good life choices in the future. We heard about cultures of bullying in some schools, but how supportive teachers, strong friendships, and how positive school culture could make all the difference. So there are many um, high quality wellbeing and healthy relationships programs and anti-bullying programs out there that schools can invest in. Um, but last year's budget expanded funding to the, for these, so to increase take up and use by schools across the country. There are also a number of reviews underway to improve the overall quality of our education system, with a particular focus on improving educational experiences and outcomes for neurodiverse learners and for Māori Pacific learners. The Ministry of Education also has a very strong youth advisory group, which is actively involved in all of these reviews. Just last night, for example, the Minister announced a new initiative to boost math skills among young Pacific learners and better engage them by using Pacific cultural examples that the children can relate to and feel comfortable with. The fourth area we heard about was racism and discrimination. The, the impacts of, of both are, are widely felt by, by children and young people at school and in their communities. That means creating safe spaces and time to discover um, and establish their own identities and not having to fit into narrow and limiting norms. Recent school surveys in our, um, in our school system, as well as the direct feedback we received, revealed shocking levels of racism, discrimination and bullying in our schools and communities, both teacher-student and peer-to-peer. -peer. So that was a reason we've made addressing racism, discrimination and stigma a whole of government priority for our first strategy. It's fair to say that work is still at an early stage, but some of the immediate actions include making sure that key aspects of New Zealand history are taught in all schools, from the early arrival of Māori to New Zealand, to the Treaty of Waitangi, to the impacts of colonisation, to the modern day, so that all students and teachers are aware of how our history has influenced and shaped the nation. That's one of a range of new actions in the education system that should also help address cultural bias and racism. The government's will and other agencies to hate speech and looking to public, publicly consult on options this year. This was given new urgency in the light of the Christchurch mosque attack in particular. Our Office of Ethnic Communities and others are working with, the, with Muslim youth groups in Christchurch on activities focused on increasing their resilience, their sense of identity, and their empowerment. They're looking at things like psychological first aid training, financial literacy, and digital safety. And if successful, the intention is to extend these activities to other ethnic groups as well. Increasing young people's sense of cultural identity and belonging in schools is another key dimension, in particular through integrating the use of the Māori language in the education system and it's a new school qualification now that recognises traditional Māori knowledge. 
There's also a whole action plan to boost Pacific languages and to support confident, thriving, and resilient Pacific young people. And the Ministry for Pacific Peoples has itself just established its own Pacific Youth Reference Group to support this work. Finally, young people consistently said they want more of a voice and to have their concerns, views, and ideas recognised and respected by adults. A fundamental aspect of being respected is being listened to. Children and young people felt adults often didn't listen to them. Wellbeing is also about having a sense of agency. Young people talked about the frustration of not having the power to change things or even having a say in what happens to them. Within Government in New Zealand, we have a Minister for Youth whose role it is, is to support a youth development approach in government policy making. And to help drive the youth specific outcomes in the strategy, that Minister and his officials are developing a more detailed plan for 12 to 24 year olds which will focus on three areas, youth voice, mental well-being, and leadership. The priority groups it's focusing on are, are Maori and Pacific, disabled young people, rainbow youth, and those from ethnic communities. So watch this space, it's in development at the moment. Another new initiative is a new national youth health and well-being survey, What About Me, it's called. It will collect information from 14,000 young New Zealanders aged 12 to 18 or what it is like to be a young person in New Zealand. This will be really important in helping us to measure progress on some of our key indicators of well-being, particularly subjective indicators, such as their ability to be themselves, young people's sense of belonging, whether they feel loved, whether they feel safe, and how they view the well-being of their family. The Ministry of Youth Development is also exploring a specific youth voice project to improve the communication channels between young people and the government. And that includes working with the Office of the Clerk in Parliament to make it easier for young people to make public submissions on draft legislation that affects them. I just want to reflect um, quickly on what went well with our engagement process and what didn't go so well. So quite clearly, the leadership of the Prime Minister and her ministerial colleagues played a significant part in engaging people. As the Prime Minister mentioned in her, in her video, she committed to reading every single one of the postcards sent to her. She also used social media to thank young people for their ideas, and in some instances wrote thank you letters to schools, to groups, and to individuals directly. This was a really powerful way of demonstrating to children and young people that their voice counts. Other ministers also supported the engagement. They took on lead roles in their own sectors, and they still regularly refer to this strategy in their work and their public statements. Another thing that was successful was going out to engage with little more than an A3 and a willingness to listen and to revise our early thinking and to take on board what we heard. We had no particular agenda or predetermined view on what the strategy should contain. Having multiple forms of engagement to suit various situations and audiences and using trusted facil local facilitators was also really crucial. We work with our partner agencies and their contacts to get on the agenda at their meetings rather than expecting people to come along to an extra event. And we try to take up any invitation we receive to speak to different groups. Doing what we said we would do was important. For example, following up with people who had specific questions that we couldn't answer on the day and updating people on our progress. Publishing summaries of what we heard was also important. And wherever possible in the public documents and our, in our advice to ministers, we use quotes from children and young people to ensure that their voices were kept front and centre in people's minds. Finally, we committed to ongoing engagement beyond the launch of the strategy. For instance, we have a regular newsletter, an e-newsletter, and a website where people can post their ideas and feedback. And we've continued to meet with groups and seek their ideas and input. It was also really helpful to be able to say that this is just the first strategy and program of action. And we'll be back to do another large scale engagement next year, ahead of the statutory refresh or review of the strategy. Some things that didn't go so well. Um, if we had more lead time, we would have um, widened our strategic partner partnering and extended our reach even further. We were a bit light on responses from some groups. For example, men, we didn't get nearly as many responses from men. 
So we needed to engage further with um, men's groups and find different ways of engaging with men. In hindsight, our online survey was a bit complicated. If we'd simplified it, we might have had more responses that way, and it certainly would have made our analysis process easier. We should have spent more time preparing um, our less experienced team members to make them feel more confident and primed for public engagement, particularly in ways of managing difficult or challenging conversations or feedback. And it was a very resource-intensive process for a small team. Uh, if we had more backup options, um, that would have helped with our other work demands. Men, we often were delayed in recording our own um, the feedback and data entry, which risked compromising the accuracy of, of our reporting. We mitigated this somewhat by sending the engagement reports back to each group for their review and feedback to help ensure that we did record it accurately. Finally, the next steps. Overall, there's been a really positive response to the strategy to date and a high level of public interest and expectation. We're working to build on that momentum, both within government and with non-government groups. We're encouraging them to align their work to the strategy where possible. For example, we've got a workshop with local government leaders from around New Zealand this month to help develop more tools and guidance for their managers working in local councils on how they can think about children and young people's interests and involve them in their day-to-day -day work. We're also using our website to showcase inspiring and innovative community activities, and we're encouraging philanthropists and other funders to consider supporting such innovations where they can. At the moment, we're writing our first six-monthly report to Cabinet on progress. That includes uh, progress on the, by the 20 or so more agencies um, on the program of action, but also to what extent they're beginning to align to the strategy more generally. The signs are really encouraging, although it's early days. Agencies are working together, they're actively using the strategy to help prioritise their budget bits right across their sectors, and they're beginning to use it to guide their longer term business planning. This suggests to us the huge value in having an overarching framework and a shared set of outcomes that ministers and agencies are collectively accountable for. We have more work to do. We need to uh, continue to soft wire or maybe cement into our system the sorts of working practices and the cultural and mental models that will ensure that children and young people's views, interests and aspirations are a natural consideration in our day-to-day -day work, whether that be policy and strategic planning or frontline service delivery. Children and young people need to be seen as key stakeholders. As Paris and the other panelists said, young people know what they want. They are the experts in their lives. Next year, uh, the Prime Minister is required to, to provide the first annual report to Parliament on progress with achieving the outcomes of that strategy. That report will include initial reporting against our wellbeing indicators and evaluation of actions to date. We are, uh, we are aware, though, that many of the issues that we're seeking to address are complex and long-standing, and it's going to take some time before we can observe national-level changes in child and youth wellbeing outcomes. We need to continue to take this longer-term strategic view. While well, the first program of action focuses very much on addressing the most pressing here and now issues with New Zealand's children and young people, our aspiration is that the next one should be more focused on their future. So towards the end of this year, we'll be asking children and young people about their vision for New Zealand's long-term future. What kind of New Zealand would they like to live in? For their children to live in? what role they want to play in creating this future, and what support they need to make it happen. I'd love to talk more with you about your young people's aspirations for Australia's future, and how we might share our thinking on this over the coming months. For now though, I'll leave you with some links to our websites for further information about our work in New Zealand, and um, um, we'd also love you to subscribe to our e e newsletter for regular updates and to share your ideas. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.